I've been given the task of talking about uh, staging early rectal cancer. Um, and one of the things about this is that we are trying to identify a relatively small group of patients with a superficial tumour that can be treated with conservative uh, avoidance of um, the full TME procedure. Now, this is a challenge because firstly, not many patients present with tumours that fall into this category. Uh, and secondly, if we do see these patients, maybe they're not always identified. So what is the role of imaging in staging of early lesions? Um, if a patient does present with an early polyp seen in endoscopy, the importance of imaging is really to confirm that the muscularis propria is preserved and to make sure that any sites of disease within the mesorectum are identified. Then, if that's the case and the patient is suitable for a local excision procedure, then really the ongoing management of that patient is completely dependent on what the final histopathology um, shows us. So, so far, there is no um, replacement for that in terms of prognostic uh, prediction of the risk of recurrence or lymph node metastases. And therefore, we very much reliant on what the final pathology shows. So, traditionally, EUS has been the preferred modality for staging early rectal cancer. And this has been on the basis of many, many studies uh, evaluating EUS over the years and surgeons feeling quite comfortable performing EUS prior to local excision. The problem is that it's not that easy to get good quality images with EUS and it's not that easy to interpret the scans. And this was an interesting paper published um, very recently looking at the whole series of publications on the subject of ultrasound staging of rectal cancer showing a steady decline in its accuracy for TNN staging and also a, re a steady reduction uh, dependent on the number of patients um, studied in a trial. So if you had a large trial, the accuracy was much worse. And this is from the um, Oxford group showing that, in fact, the reality of staging EUS in the community is even worse, with 45% um, of patients inaccurately staged. And furthermore, the information from the staging hasn't so far improved the outcomes for these patients um, being selected for a TEM procedure or um, local excision. And why is that? Why should that be? Well, I think the main reason for this is that the original data from EUS was looking at very superficial lesions. Um, and when you use a very high frequency probe, it's very easy to see a flat lesion and to stage those. But I think when you start to try to evaluate more uh, bulky lesions, that's when the struggle happens. Uh, and I think this illustrates very well the problem faced by EUS, which is that when you have a bulky tumour like this, it's very easy to see the near field, high resolution um, uh, depiction of the tumour. But as you go further and further away from the probe, so you get less and less information. And that's because the um, probe itself is susceptible to uh, anything more than five or 10 millimetres depth. It starts to, the image degrades. So uh, this has been shown by um, Konishi, who did a paper in 2003, demonstrating with his uh, analysis of the data that the accuracy of staging polyps in the rectum was completely size dependent. So the larger the lesion, the more inaccurate uh, the technique would be. And so they, re they felt very strongly that EUS-based evaluation wasn't appropriate to determine what sort of treatment for villous type lesions. So that really is the limitation of EUS because it's not able to really deal with uh, lesions that are bulkier than say 20 millimeters in diameter or more than five millimeters thick. And then it calls into question what value it really has in these early lesions when they can probably be assessed very well 
uh, using uh, colonoscopic techniques. So in 1994, this paper, which is a, a really elegant study, was published by Mitch Schnell in the States. Um, he studied 12 patients with rectal cancer and used an endorectal probe. But for the first time since MRI had been developed, he was able to show that you could demonstrate the layers of the rectal wall. And you could see the uh, mucosa, the submucosa, and the muscularis propria. The, the thing to note about this paper is, using the endorectal coil, he used a T2-weighted high-resolution sequence, and he managed to get a pixel size of 0.5 by 0.5 millimeters. But he acknowledged at the time that this wasn't necessarily going to be the solution for staging early rectal cancers, because using an endorectal probe, you may be limited by the sort of patients that you could actually evaluate. Uh, and also there was a problem, again, with distortion due, due to inserting the coil close to the tumors. So this was a huge inspiration for me in 1995, having read that paper. And with the new phased array machines that were available in, in, at that time, and with the new improvements in software, we were able to achieve the same sort of resolution using a 0.6 by 0.6 um, pixel size and being able to visualize the anatomy as, as well. And here you see the mucosa with its pattern, its characteristic pattern, which is what we look for. Uh, we look for disruption of this pattern for the T1 tumors. So, in terms of staging these tumours, it's very important to be systematic um, and not to jump to the wrong conclusion. In, in the UK, we've been running training workshops for radiologists uh, for the last 10 years, and this drill enables um, radiologists to hopefully assess the tumours uh, systematically and get the stage correct. Um, these binary questions, these questions which have either yes or no answer to them, are very important to run through when actually um, trying to figure out what the stage of a tumour is. And asking that question, can you see the submucosa, is such an important one because that enables you to identify those T1 lesions that are amenable to local excision. So in that way, you can not only measure the depth, you can measure the depth of spread extramurally and, and so on. So here's an example of a polyp lesion which um, is showing the preservation of the submucosa at the advancing edge of the polyp. Uh, and therefore, one would be able to call this a T1 lesion. So the role of imaging, and MR imaging in particular in early lesions, is to confirm that the muscularis propria thickness is, con is preserved. And that is something we can do quite easily using MRI. We can also look for disease within the mesorectum, again, something that we can do quite well with MRI. The um, point about staging these tumors is it doesn't matter what height they're at, you can still get a, a good axial image, even if they're bulky lesions. And the, the point about um, understanding the anatomy of these tumors is really about understanding the muscularis anatomy, for example, here where you've got preservation of the muscularis. You know that this is a T2 tumor, but not the, there's no tumor signal beyond those fibers of the muscularis propria. So this is, this is how you would identify a T2 tumor. So early stage tumors are, are well um, uh, visualized with MRI, but we can also identify a discontinuous vascular invasion. It's something that EUS has not really been very successful at doing. Uh, and this is an example of, of a, a vein with tumor surrounding it. So this is venous invasion, which is quite remote from here. There's no tumor at all in the lumen. This is normal uh, mucosa, normal rectal wall, uh, an example of venous invasion. So um, nodal staging as well it means that we can look at uh, sites of nodal disease quite remote from the actual primary tumor. Um, and here, for example, is a nodal deposit quite close to the mesorectal fascia. So <clears throat> the advantage of MR over EUS is that we have a coverage um, that is superior to EUS and able to really visualize the entire mesorectum all the way up to L5S1. The problem for all of us, for 
EUS and for MRI is that the very nature of these early stage tumours is associated with tiny micrometastatic disease. And so that is our challenge, because, and that is why we rely so much on the pathology to give us the, the prognostic risk for whether or not a patient might have um, a risk of uh, lymph node metastases. So in the future, we, what we need to understand is following local excision, what are the documented patterns of recurrence? Is it, is it these microscopic lymph nodes? Or is it uh, tumour regrowth close to the TEM scar? What is the time to relapse after local excision? And therefore, if we know this information, what the ideal follow-up schedule should be for MRI uh, following TEM procedures. And also, what is the long-term prognostic relevance of these so-called micrometastatic uh, nodes? And what is the role of adjuvant chemo radiotherapy in high-risk T1 tumours? None of this we actually know. Uh, and all of these are good research questions, really, that we need to establish somehow if we're to improve the way in which we manage T1 lesions in the future. So for patients with a low-lying T2 tumour, most of the patients that we come across, they want to avoid an APE. They don't really want to put themselves through um, a big operation for something that is seemingly a relatively early-stage tumour. And here we have all these options, um, preoperative chemoradiotherapy with possible excision of the scar, intersphincteric and anterior resection, or even deferral of surgery. All of these get discussed now in our MDTs, and really because the patient wants it. So, for example, here we have a patient with a T2 tumor low down who was facing an abdominoperineal excision, but after treatment has, has a scar. At that time, we were obliged to operate on these patients, but every patient we did so, we regretted because we knew that these patients were likely to have either a complete or a near-complete response. And so taking uh, a lesson, really, from Angelita Abagama's group in Brazil, we, we got the courage to set up the deferral of surgery trial, looking at these sort of patients and trying to avoid surgery where they've had a near-complete response. So, Really, the recommendations for staging early rectal cancers are as follows. Firstly, technique is really important. Here, you would not be able to say that this patient has an early stage tumour. You'd be wondering if there was tumour spread through the rectal wall. That's a low resolution scan. It doesn't look any different to maybe some of the scans you see, but it's low resolution. The voxel size is 1.6. It's not the same as Mitch Schnell's paper from 1994. Um, and here is the same patient scanned a week later, and you can see the muscularis propria preserved, you can see the polyp and the stalk, and therefore you can say this is a T1 lesion. So the resolution makes a difference. The difference between this scan and that scan was 10 minutes. Uh, it's the same machine, you, you can do exactly the same thing, but um, it's, it's to do with um, spending enough time to get the images. And when you look at the literature in MRI, it's littered with poor, quality, low-resolution studies. Nearly all of them published have large voxel size. So that is a problem if we're to take things forward. We need to harmonize the quality of scans. So to recommend what we should do, we should look at the morphology of these tumors, measure the diameter, and if they're polypoidal, look at the site and diameter of the stalk. Um, we should look at the, which quadrant the, the lesion is, is um, centred on so that the surgeon can plan the possibility of local excision, assess the degree of preservation of the mucosa, submucosa, and the muscularis propria layers, and to also assess the extramural disease as well as the height of the lesion. All of this information should be in a report for an early rectal cancer stage. And if all of this is there, then I'm sure um, the outcomes will improve. Just to quickly show you some examples, this is a, a polypoidal tumor with preservation of the submucosa. This is the typical sort of report that one would issue with that kind of tumor. And, and in doing so, you can identify a, a patient who could, it, with a very low tumor, who could have local excision as an initial procedure. And that's exactly what she had. And her, her final stage was T1 um, SM2. And these are the sort of cases that increasingly we can pick up on MRI routinely in our lists and go through them in the MDT and propose that maybe this patient needn't have primary surgery, but they could have a local excision first. And on often the patients are incredibly grateful for this opportunity. 
Um, here's an example of a patient who perhaps most people wouldn't put through for local excision, but it was a possibility. She had a T1 SM3 and again a low tumour. And that's what she had. She had a local excision because it was such a small tumour with a, a small point of contact. Um, she had the Thames procedure and uh, the final stage was T2. We don't know what her risk is for nodal metastases within the pelvis, but her preference was to avoid uh, an APE, which is what she needed if, if she was going to have a, an operation. This is the post-TEMS aftermath, but this is her follow-up a year later. And, and we will continue to follow her up, and that, that's the important thing, is to monitor these patients and to um, make sure that they get the adjuvant uh, therapy that they need. So surveillance is really important, and she's doing well, but... Um, in part of that surveillance is the evaluation of the lymph nodes, and we look at the mesorectum. We also ensure that we cover the mesorectum all the way up to L5-S1, again, using the same high-resolution technique. Um, this is uh, an example when, and I only found one out of the 59 or 60 patients that we've treated in the last three years with local excision. This is our um, lo nodal recurrence, one case. Uh, but you can see um, that the lymph node has changed in its, its appearance, uh, indicating a malignant node. So um, I think to summarise, um, the, the use of MRI has enabled us to identify patients suitable for local excision, more so than previously. Um, and I think that with the improvements in surgical technique and follow-up, we, we are able to um, use MRI I think it comes into its own for the bulky polyps and for assessment of disease remote from the lumen. Uh, it's able to uh, allow the surgeon to plan the local excision and to know whether it's safe to do so and whether the TEM plane or the local excision plane is safe. EUS, I think, should be reserved for the very early flat lesions and its limited assessment of the mesorectum means that you cannot rely on it on its own um, currently and um, perhaps it would be useful for, for planned ESR procedures, which we're going to hear about as well. So that's really the very simple algorithm for assessment of early-stage tumours, EUS for the early um, small lesions, but MRI and CT scanning of the thorax, abdomen, pelvis for staging the bulkier ones. Thank you.